Katie Edwards. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It is our pleasure. Lisa from The Novel Approach raved about The Hanged Man, and it ended up in her top of 2019 list just a couple weeks ago. I was just listening to the podcast. The year is new, but it's the best thing that's happened to me this year so far. How about that? That's excellent. Just kick off the year that way. Yeah. For those who don't know the tarot sequence, tell us about that series and then about the latest book, The Hanged Man. Sure. It is The Hangman just came out in December. It's the second book in the tarot sequence. It, it essentially is a bit of a reimagining of the Atlantis tale. Instead of having been a mythical island that sank beneath the sea, I imagine that is something that was uncovered by humanity in the 1960s when technology started to reach out towards the star. And they were able to actually see Atlantis from outer space, which is something they hadn't been able to see, say, from a ship or an airplane. And once I had this idea in my head of, of something like that, this lost civilization novel, I started kind of coloring in the details. And I've always wanted to do a novel based around the tarot mythology and the and tarot cards and the major arcana. And then combine that with elements of, I love urban fantasy, I love mystery, I love touches of romance, I'm a huge believer of found family and different sorts of love and family type relationships and series. And all that came together to the story that I published, and I've got a lot planned for it, but the second one um, just hit, I've been pretty pleased with the reaction so far. Where do readers find themselves as The Hanged Man opens? When all is said and done, I want to. I, this is going to be nine novels. I have nine novels planned, and they're three trilogies. So, Hangman is a bit of a bridge between the beginning and the climax of the first trilogy, and I was really nervous about that because not only is it a, a bit of a middle child, it's also my sophomore effort being published, and you you always worry that it's going to get lost in the shuffle or not live up to expectations, or people will simply see it as a bridge to the third novel, but. For the most part, that hasn't happened at all. It picks up right after the events in the first novel. I am definitely leading to something big in the third novel, but so far from what I've been sussing out from readers, it really stands on its own as a story, and I'm really happy about that because there are certain elements of it that I've been playing around with for years, waiting to see on page, and pretty happy with the reaction so far. Excellent. Where did you get the inspiration to decide that Atlantis was this thing that you could see from space in the 1960s? Where did all that come from? I have no, I, I guess I, I've i always, I, I, I've talked about this before, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'll tell you something else I haven't told many people, but I've always wanted to do a lost civilization novel. I find I'm just fascinated by not just I mean, there there are many different mythologies based around lost civilizations. Atlantis is only one of them. But not just that, but think about the period of time in human history when the entire world was essentially a lost civilization. No one knew, you know, what existed on the other side of the globe or, you know, all the different pathways they charted with the seas. And I've always been interested in that time period. It's just, you know, ripe for fiction and especially the supernatural. And I when I had this idea about well how could Atlantis possibly exist and thinking about how it could be hidden from the world and when would that be revealed would they make the decision or would technology reach the point where it would be impossible to hide it from from the rest of you know essentially the human world and I started doing this research about I actually contacted NASA and asked them when the first rocket was that flew over the northern Atlantic that took pictures of the curvature of the world. So I knew literally what was the first rocket in orbit that passed over where I would imagine my island of New Atlantis or Atlantis was um, going to be built. So I put a lot of thought into the backstory before I finally started writing it, but I found, you know, it's people know a little bit about Atlantis in the sense of it's a myth, but they don't know enough that I can create whatever I want out of it. So it was mm -hmm. a, a bit of a slate that someone gave me, but more or less a blank slate. I love that you called NASA. Even myself as an author, I wouldn't think to call NASA. I'd be looking that up on Google somewhere, but I like that you called them. 
you could I couldn't find it on Google. That's how esoteric that information is. How I mean, it's I mean, even now knowing the answer, you can't find it on a search on Google. It's buried in one of my email accounts. It's actually going to be an element for one of my future novels. But they were I, I would imagine they loved the question because it took a couple of weeks to get a response. But they're like, yeah, we had fun tracking this down. <laughs> How did you even know who to call? I mean, oh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at researching. I do human resources in my day job, but I also work for a university system, and I'm involved in higher ed. And any job I've ever had has always had a huge research component to it. So I'm pretty good about, you know, ferreting stuff out when I need to. That's just awesome. So some of the questions I have for you, I actually got from Lisa because she had questions. <laughs> I definitely am going to appreciate those questions because she has given me so many great recommendations for my own book list and my own reading list throughout the year. So why the tarot? Why did you go with the tarot? And how did you decide to use that as the idea as inspiration for characters? I, I, part of it, well, I guess it goes back to like golden age fantasy from say like the 80s with Piers Anthony when he did his incarnation of immortality. And he took some really huge elements of the universe and and turn them into people. He had people set, standing in for fate and time and death. And those are the three that I remember. I'm sure there are more, God and the devil. And I just love the idea of that. I, there's something about archetypes that have always appealed to me, and not just on a grand scale of like the backstory, like the major arcana of tarot cards or you know forces of human nature, but even my characters are archetypes. Since I've been wanting to write as a kid, I have my rune, what I call my rune archetype, my brand archetype. I have others that I'll put in other stories, but it seems like it's such an easy way or almost like a shorthand with communicating with people. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, you have your comic relief character, you have your, your, your wise ass, you have your, you know, your smart scholarly library type character for stories. But for the tarot cards, the major arcana in particular, I mean, I think they were, they're all based on imagery. Different tarot cards have different images, but imagery is huge. So turning those into real people or real thrones and real courts, it seemed like kind of a natural step to me. And plus, each of the major arcana tarot cards are really based around human appetites and elements of the human experience, like, you know, fortune and nature and death and religion. So it made exploring them a little bit more interesting. Mm-hmm. Did you go so far as to use the tarot to set the characters' personalities and even to see what they might do in certain situations or to help inspire the book further? I do a little bit. Definitely not as much as my readers think. And my readers come up with some interpretations that blow me out of the water. If anything, they've done more research than I have. And I mean, the whole thing about tarot cards is it's based upon unconscious symbolism. So sometimes it's even hard to tell what you intend and what you don't intend. But Tarot cards also kind of give you a buffer in that, depending on how you read them, they can be normal upward facing or they can be reversed if they're upside down in the reading. So that really covers basically what the tarot card means and its exact opposite. <laughs> so that gives me a little bit of wiggle room if I'm a little bit off. But I did research um, in the sense of, for instance, I like the sun court I picked because it seems a little bit like a card associated with the phoenix. And this is definitely a story about redemption of a court in a way and a, um, the, the prince of a fallen court. And also the sun card in, in like a tower reading can also have to do with artists and creativity and works of art. And that applies to me as a writer. So I, I definitely – who I picked for my bad guys and good guys is definitely inspired by some of what I know personally of tarot cards. Mm -hmm. Were you interested in tarot or using them outside of the writing, or did you get I, I into do. it because of the writing? No, I do. And I, I think, no, I got into, well, I heard about them. They interested me, I thought, from a creative perspective, and then I started using them myself. And they're really good tools of meditation. I mean, I'm not going to read too much into the metaphysics of it, but when you sit down with a deck of tarot cards and you have a question and all these images appear in front of you, your mind starts making connections. And I'm a firm believer that we all kind of know what we need to do in any given situation, but this is a really good way of connecting you with, damn, that's right. I've got to pay more attention to this, or this is an important part of my life. So I do tarot readings every now and then. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in them, but I, like I said, the, the just the entire concept of the symbolisms they have in them and the different interpretations and using it almost like as a tool of meditation has always fascinated me. Mm -hmm. 
And I've, I've become fascinated by it more recently, too, because I've heard more and more authors using tarot for various things in their writing, whether it's determining characters or trying to unblock if they're stuck in a scene or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm intrigued by that. I have not heard that. That's interesting. It's come um, up on two or three podcasts lately. It's really been interesting. Like, it's, it, like the, there's this moment of tarot that's happening in like the last six months. Yeah, I know. I want to kind of discourage that. So if you could tell anyone, that, hey, that idea is already taken, go somewhere else. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm, I, I kind of want to plant my flag here. But I for even when I first started out telling this story, I had backups for everything. Like, mm -hmm. what if another like series came out that heavily used the tarot for an urban fantasy or what if another Atlantis novel came out? I had backups for pretty much everything I wanted to accomplish, but this is what I settled on. It really, it, it's hard to describe if you have no experience with it, but especially for people who think it's like something, you know, quote new age or whatever, what I would have to say is every card and all the interpretations are just littered with hundreds of different types of symbolism. And as you're reading through them, something snags in your brain and you start drawing connections. And I, I don't think there's any necessarily divine force driving it. I think that your brain in some cases is the divine force. And just looking at the cards really can make things clearer if you just kind of empty your mind of everything else. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Rune and Brand a little bit. H sure. How do you describe their relationship? Oh, uh, they're my favorite two characters I've ever written. I just absolutely love every moment I spend with them. So essentially in the series, Rune is the prince of sorts. He's the prince of a fallen throne. So he comes from a very, very strong bloodline, and he is Atlantean. Brand is human, but he's been with Rune since they were together in the crib. Literally a couple days old, they were put together in the crib, and they were bonded in via a metaphysical type spell that's called companionship. And Brand is Rune's companion, a lifelong advisor and bodyguard and... Um, just meant to be something as close as brothers. And the two of them, I, I don't know what I intended when I started. I mean, certainly I wanted them to be close friends, but it just became way more than that. To have someone who shares a light telepathic bond with you, someone who will always have your back, uh, something closer than family, intimate without being, being lovers, something, especially since they're two men. This is obviously a very queer, positive story and Rune's in a relationship with a man as the story unfolds. But Rune and Brand, while they're very um, intimate, they'll share a space on the sofa together. You know, Brand will give Rune a, a, a shoulder rub, but I don't have them being sexually intimate. So kind of exploring a way for two men to have a relationship, but avoiding all the landmines of toxic masculinity has been a lot of fun. It's a joy to write them. I mean, I suppose I would say that I remember do you, there's a series, it's on reruns, Murphy Brown. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, for sure. So Murphy Brown, like, is a delightful character to watch, like, on the television. Like, she is, she comes up with the greatest sayings, and she can put people down in a moment's notice. But it would actually be kind of unnerving to know a person like that, <laughs> because, <laughs> I mean, they're incredibly sharp-tongued, and at some point they would make you feel six inches tall. And Brand is like that. He's a Murphy Brown-type character, but he shares a bond with Rune, so Rune knows Literally everything that comes out of Brand's mouth is driven by actual concern and affection and love. And because of that, Rune can respond in a way to Brand that is natural to them, meaning he's never hurt because underneath it he knows that Brand really cares about him. And so having that as a basis allows me to work in just a different type of love that I've never been able to do between characters before. And people seem to be responding to it. That's incredible. Uh... It touches on so many things that we just see in society today. And it also plays into your aspect of family a little bit, too, because these two are not biological brothers. They didn't really find each other because they were bound at birth. But there's that extra stuff there. Yeah, I'm a, I love found family. Any story with found family is is so meaningful to me. I mean, as, as someone, you know, my age, how you grew up, I mean, it is not the same world as when I was a kid. And when I was growing up, coming out of the closet was something that you did almost in your 20s and it very rarely happened in your teens and by the time you came out your entire life was different and found family was the community you made was so important and it's nice to th see things are a little bit different now though found family i think is always going to be a big thing in the gay community but mm -hmm. working on that in any writing story that i tell loving that in any book i read is sort of a cornerstone of me creatively 
How surreal is it for you to have fan art created? I don't have words for it. I I don't like I I don't. It, I mean, this has been going on since last sun, and it really took off with the lead up to the publication of Hangman. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people designing cards and artwork. Some people doing interpretive dance as part of their review. Interpretive dance inspired by my novel. Wow. Um, making mini quilts, doing crossword puzzles, coming up with drink recipes based on the characters or cookie recipes based on the characters. My readers are amazing. They are, I, I don't even have words to say how much I appreciate them and what an experience they've made for this. I did not expect this. I'm still not sure if this is normal, <laughs> but all I know is every day something new happens where it, it, someone comes up with something that takes my breath away. It's a weird relationship, too, because in some cases, the representation that they've created of my characters, in a way, has helped kind of driven the narrative. <laughs> like, there's this one um, amazing artist, their name is Vic Gray, and they've done a lot of artwork around some of the secondary characters, including Lady Death, who makes an appearance as one of the major arcana in Novel 2, and will become very important. And Vic's representation of Lady Death essentially defines now what I think of Lady Death in my head. It's such like a gorgeous piece of artwork. I, I literally don't have words to describe what what it's been like um, having reader interaction of this level. You know, having setting up a Discord channel because they want to interact with me. The, the, the emails I get from people who talking about living in countries where it's not really easy to get gay literature and what this has meant to them, or talking about how having a story with, you know, without the toxic masculinity and having different types of male love and how much they appreciate something like that. it's really going to drive me to try to do better with each novel. That's incredible. I love how you're getting this work out into countries where access to the gay literature isn't what it is in the U S. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cause there too often we think of things from like, you know, a U.S. perspective and I, this experience has really broken me from that trying to remember I mean, things are wildly different elsewhere in the world and what access is like, how different it is overseas than it might be where we are now. It's That's been an eye-opening experience. Mm -hmm. What's the furthest away, out of the way place that you've heard from that really surprised you? Mongolia. Mongolia, wow. Yes, and they, and they, at least one person there, and this person's awesome, they've like translated quotes and elements of the last son and the hangman into traditional mongolian script it's i i mean again things like that that just it just it's humbling to a degree that it's even hard to put into words how grateful i am but mongolia i've i i have a lot of readers and the lead up to the reveal of the hangman there were three of us who worked on it including kathy who's in canada and sayo who's in finland i have readers in south america who reach out all the time in asian countries it's pretty rewarding. That is really wonderful to, to see the story go worldwide like that. My book has traveled well better than I have. <laughs> I, I have never left the <laughs> continental North American continent, so my book has been overseas before I have. <laughs> you said you've got nine books planned in the series. Are they all planned out? Do you know where you're going in terms of like the big plot points or is it more granular than that at this point no nope, i know exactly what's going to happen right to the last scene there's room for some things to evolve on their own definitely flexibility along the way but i know the plot of each book i know the three individual arcs one of the big things of the first three books are that the narrator uh, while I think he's very accessible to readers. He's also keeping something from them. So finding out what Rune is keeping from readers is the first three books. And the next three books involve things that have been kept from Rune his entire life. And then the last three books are more or less going to be my no holds bar end game. But it's his story for all nine novels. And each novel, I think, is going to be different enough in flavor that it makes actually easy to plan. You know, you have your one book where it might be about contagion or one book that might be about a natural disaster as the background. And it makes it kind of easy for me to distinguish it between them as I plan them. That's cool. That's got to be helpful to be able to think of it along those lines. And, of course, that you leave yourself open to make some discoveries along the way, too. 
Yeah, I, mean, I think the only thing that I've deliberately not planned out is who Rune is going to wind up with romantically. So I've been very clear with readers. I am not going to close any doors on that. That'll just make it for more fun as you go. I think so, too. And See I find out stuff leads. as I write. So Lisa is extremely interested to know if there's a planned release date for book three yet. There is not. I'm actually writing it right now. And the the publisher I have is would, was waiting for The Hangman to come out. It was a two-book contract to see how things go. But whether um, this publisher picks it up or whether I put it out myself, there will definitely be a Tarot 3. The response has been really, really nice. I mean, the... It, I I have great readers, and they purchase my book, and then they buy the audiobook, and then they buy the digital book, and the kind of response I've seen so far has basically guarantees that there's more life left in the series. Now, this is your debut, this series. What got you into writing? I I don't even remember to this day. I don't remember the first thing. I remember when I was really, really young, someone gave me a box of Hardy Boy books, like old fashioned like you know mass printed blue covered hardy boy books i've always wanted to write i always since i was a kid and i have this this is the first thing i've ever published it's certainly not the first novel i ever wrote but this is the first time i ever sent anything out to see if it would get published so i do feel pretty lucky it did and then of course the readers that you've gotten so far just makes it all the more sweet of course yeah, and I think it says a lot about the world. I mean, when I first sent it out, I was convinced when I talked with my agent that, you know, like, I really want to break into mainstream someday. And, and Sarah Megabell, my agent, she would constantly stop me. And she goes, Keith, this is mainstream. You know, just because you have gay characters, this is mainstream. And it turns out she was absolutely right. I thought that I would wind up in some weird niche somewhere. <laughs> um, and it wouldn't appeal to a wider audience other than, say, gay men. And lo and behold, that's not the case at all. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, so it's been rewarding for me to see how different the world is now and how much more acceptance of different kinds of types of storyline. And especially a lot of young people who, I mean, they, I don't even think they view this necessarily as a gay series. It's just something with, you know, a found family element and relationships that they're, they're attracted to that makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. Well, and you, you know, you deal with Atlantis, so I think you hit several elements there all together. Yeah, I try to make it interesting, too. I put a lot of work into the backstory. You know, maybe maybe 5% of it will find its way onto a page, but uh, you can always tell, I think, when a writer knows more than the reader does, um, mm -hmm. that they could answer any question down to what is the average shopping mall like? You know, what is grocery shopping like in your world that you've created? You know, once you can start answering those really picky questions, even if they never wind up on the page, I think it does translate to readers have a sense of confidence that you built a world that you know more about as an author. Right. And it gives you plenty of room, too, to even have little extras along the way that you can drop blog posts or emails or whatever to whet the appetite. <laughs> I do. I do free novellas between every novel, too. So that's oh, been fun. I'm a little bit behind on the one that was supposed to happen between number one and two, but it's almost done. It's going to be about an 80-page novella. How did you decide that this series was going to be the thing that made your debut? I kind of knew I wanted to write this series, and I kind of knew that I wasn't ready to write this series. So there was a point where I finally kind of settled down in my day job. I had a really good day job. I had a steady paycheck. I didn't have to worry about bills. I could finally say, well, I want to really take writing seriously. I want to send something out to an agent. But first, I backed off for a couple of years, and I wrote a gay mystery. Then I wrote a young adult novel. I also wrote a contemporary fiction novel. Three novels that will never, ever, ever be released from my drawer. <laughs> they're, they're literally locked in a drawer, and no one's seen any of them. And it got me to the point where I could do a novel from beginning to end and understand what worked for me and what didn't, especially with the, the craft of writing, you know, planning versus um, pantser versus planner. And I got to the point where I'm like, okay, now or never. And I started writing the prologue to Last Sun, the first novel. And it's just like, you just know sometimes this is what I was meant to write. And that's the feeling I had when I started it. Mm hmm are you going to tackle these nine novels straight on or are there other things you're kind of looking at to do as like in betweens or anything like that? I will definitely do some things in between. I, I definitely want to try to produce at least 
a terror novel at least every year. And if it takes off and there's a lot of interest, I'll do them even more frequently. But I've got other series I want to write as well. So, And I've always wanted to do a young adult series. So I, that's not not even on the back burner. It's sort of on a middle burner right now. Mm-hmm. And I was going to ask, because you mentioned like you wrote the young adult, you had a mystery, like what other genres you wanted to tackle too. So yeah. young adult, definitely in the future somewhere. Yeah, I've been playing. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big video game player too. I bought a Switch to play this game called Fire Emblem Three Houses. And it's a bit of a, like a Harry Potter type storyline, but heavily like Asian role-playing game type theme as well. And it's made me realize how much I want to write a boarding house novel. A magical boarding house novel. I want to write my Harry Potter novel <laughs> <laughs> um, with my own stamp on it, my own complete take, my own, you know, my own type of world building. But I've always loved stuff like that. You know, things like, you know, college age stories, you know, going on um, boarding schools, things like that. I, I've always wanted to write something like that. So I think I'm going to be focusing on that next. Oh, very cool. So hopefully we get uh, another tarot sequence book in 2020 is there anything else on your 2020 radar that you can tease us i do the free novellas between each story so i owe readers one i've been publishing it chapter by chapter and i've got two left for a novella called the sunken mall and i do have another novel which started out as ya it's a standalone but rapidly it turned into more of a new adult than young adult Mm. that is done it just needs a little bit of tweaking and then my agent's going to be sending it out but it's it's a little it's different from it's sort of tarot sequence light in that I don't have as much deep world building, but I still focused on the elements of like found family and romance and relationships between characters. That's still a big part of it. Very cool. So how can people keep up with you online to know when all of this stuff is happening? Twitter is probably the best place right now. That's I, if you if I had to pick one thing I focus on, it's going to be Twitter right now, and that's at KD Edwards underscore NC. I definitely do all my announcements through that and any free material I have snippets. I, there are a lot of sites that do like the quote of the week or the um, book scene of the week. And I, I take advantage of that a lot between my novels and kind of tease stuff that's about to come out. So that's probably one of the best ways. And then KD Edwards at dot com is um, my website. All right. Fantastic. We will put links to all this stuff and the books uh, in the show notes page for this episode so people can easily find everything. Thank you. Keith, thank you so much for coming and telling us about the tarot sequence. Wish you the best of success with The Hanged Man and very, very much looking forward to what you have coming up next. Well, thank you. And thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. 